another Board Game Breakfast. Welcome to another week about games, and it's so exciting. We are in the middle of August, and we are going through piles, piles of Gen Con games. And as I said in one of my live feeds, but I'll say it again, I'm getting several emails from people saying, when are you reviewing this? Will you review this soon? We are trying to review as many games as we possibly can, folks. But, you know, the constraints of time and us actually playing the different games and such, we'll get them done. But I just can't tell you which ones will be done first and such. Just hopefully you'll enjoy some of the games that we put out each week. Speaking of that, if you missed it, yesterday we posted a video, a uh, inside look or a background look at Cool Stuff Inc., where I take you and look inside the warehouse at Cool Stuff. So go check out that video. And we're still running our contest throughout August where you could win a $50 gift certificate to Cool Stuff Inc. And one, this is like a network wide contest. You can go enter this contest in many different places on the Dice Tower Network on many of our shows, including Board Game Blender and um, the Dice Tower Audio Show. And anyhow, one of those winners of a $50 gift certificate will be getting a $500 hundred dollar gift certificate instead to enter from this show all you have to do is email us at dice tower at gmail.com in the subjects setting you need to put breakfast spelled correctly as i found many people can't um, breakfast in the subject heading if it's not there you're not in a contest and then in the comments just tell us what is your favorite part of board game breakfast that's all you have to do and let's see, there's a live Q&A tonight. We're going to do this one at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so come check that out. I know it's a later time for some people. It won't work for others. But I try to change them up at the different times so people around the world have a chance to be involved. Okay, time for the news. Well, first in the news, Cryptozoic has made a deal with GameStop. So you're going to start seeing their games show up in GameStop. And that makes sense because their games are the type of games that would probably appeal to people who play video games. You know, you got the DC Deck Builder and all the different uh, licenses. They basically just licenses, you know. So I think people will, I think that will be a good match as time goes by. Origins has announced that they have totally revamped the Origins board game uh, categories. In fact, um, there used to be eight categories, each with several subcategories. So essentially, there's like 17 or 18 awards. They've narrowed it down. The categories are now board games, card games, which also includes deck building games or even dice building games, collectible games, not just collectible cards, but collectible, collectible games, whatever it is, RPGs, family accessory and miniatures family could be anything accessory could be it has to be an actual accessory not just another miniature for a line folks this is a wonderful change i cannot tell you how happy i am as i've said in the past there is now a new president for gamma there's new people on the board that were are forward thinking they've got rid of categories like play by mail you know they so they're just narrowing this whole thing down now of course People who have games and companies and some of the categories that are eliminated may not be happy, but this is if this, if this award is going to mean anything, this is a big deal. This is important for people to be able to say, okay, what is the best board game? And not that's that weird family children party category that's gone now. So kudos. I've been yelling about Origins Awards for years. This is one of the best steps they've taken. I'm very excited about it. WizKids, speaking of which, very big news from them. They're having a new game coming, Star Trek Frontiers. Ah, another Star Trek game, you might say. But folks, this game designed by Andrew Parks is based on the Vladishvato Mage Knight board game system. That's very intriguing. It'd be interesting to see that kind of system with a Star Trek overlay. Now, I don't think it's just a new theme. There's going to be some changes in the game, but I think this one's going to get a lot of buzz. The IGA Award nominees were announced, International Gaming uh, Association Awards, or International Gaming Awards, I'm sorry. Uh, these awards are, were for any game released between July 1st, 2014 and June 30th, 2015. You can go to their website to see them. There's a, just a whole slate of awards. They do the multiplayer and then two-player. The multiplayer category is very, very Euro-centric. You will not find a non-Euro game there. Um, while the two-player category is all over the place, like for the example, they've Armada. And that's fine, That's but that's just so you know, that's kind of where this category is. I always consider the IGA winner the best Euro game of the year. And let's see here. 
the state of Washington has successfully concluded a suit against Altius. Um, this is a company that uh, made asylum playing cards. They raised $25,000. They did not deliver. They must now pay $54,000, which back to the backers, back to the court fees and all that sort of thing. Unfortunately, it's only for backers in the state of Washington. Although they said if you're in a state that's not in Washington, they encourage you to bring this up. This is good. Good, because setting these precedents means that people are not going to back out of Kickstarter so willingly because they will end up paying more than they got. Good, good, good. Hello, greetings, friends of the Dice Tower. We have a very special with the PD today. It is, as far as I know, the first ever board game breakfast crossover with the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. We have two special guests here, if you can introduce yourself. I'm Jamie, one of the hosts of the Secret Cabal. And I'm Chris, one of the other hosts of the Secret Cabal. As we are here in Beer Bongers, where the Secret Cabal founders host board game night twice a month. Absolutely. So what are you able to do here at Beer Bongers? Drink beer. Drink beer, And course. play games at the same time. How can you beat that? I don't think you can. I don't think you can beat that with a stick. So <laughs> what, did you, what did you play tonight? Forbidden Stars is one of my top five games of all time at this point. Oh, wow. I'm willing to say that now. I absolutely adore this game. It has everything I want in a game. It's wonderful. Forbidden Stars is wonderful. We'll okay. See. This is the first time I've played it, so we'll see. About two years, roughly, now we've been, we've been doing it. Started with one person, and it has grown to what? Like about 15 to 20 people like every week? Every week. Oh, fantastic. And I understand you have a special holiday tradition here, too. Well, yeah, we have our Christmas get together. Yeah. Yeah. And that draws pretty easy. Right? Oh, yeah, people usually come from out of state to come up to hang out with us on Christmas and play games here and drink beer. We do it for 12 hours. Oh, wow. That's all there. Yeah. On Christmas Day? Uh, no, not oh, Christmas oh, Day. Okay. It's like a week before or something home. like that. that was the game. Yeah. Tony, Tony and Brian live out of state, sure. Florida and California, yeah. and they come in for Christmas. And oh, Steve actually just awesome. comes, so all five of us are here. Playing games right around Christmas, it's, it's a great oh, time. Well, that's probably like the only time all five of Europe can get together on year. <laughs> that and Gen Con and Origins, that kind of stuff is really the only time. Fantastic. Hey, well, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. And if you don't listen to The Secret Cabal, that's what we do. The first and third Wednesdays of every month. Pretty much so, yeah. Fantastic. It is the best source of the internet for this world in that sense. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Today our question is about the multiple editions there are of many board games. Uh, let's say, for example, Cosmic Encounter has gone through more editions probably than any other game in history. I think there's like seven or eight. Uh, Twilight Imperium, there's Twilight Imperium 1, 2, and 3. And there are other games, the new Runebound and such. And a person, the question was, are these previous editions ever worth hunting down and playing? And or should you play those first before you play the new ones for a new someone who's new getting into gaming? Let's do the second part first. And the second part, to me, is pretty obvious. Maybe you disagree. I know we'll disagree in the first part. But the second part, <laughs> if you are new, just play the newest version. There's no reason to go out of your way to hunt down an expensive, out-of-print edition just to learn a game. And most of the time with these newer versions, they're, easy, they're easier to play, almost always. I, I agree. I agree with that. Um, usually, if a newer version of a game comes out, they've streamlined the game Let's look at a good example, a game that I really love, Fury of Dracula. The original game played in about six hours or so. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. yes. Eight hours, maybe. but um, That's still a long time. But then Fantasy Flight redid the game, streamlined it, and it played in like four hours. So usually if a game is redone, they've modified rules and made the game streamlined and easier to play. And most of those games that are being reprinted are games that came out in the 80s or 90s and then need to be reprinted for the 2010s. Right, so that's, that, that's the easy part. Now where we probably disagree is, are these older versions ever working worth checking out? And in my opinion, with one exception, I will say no. They're not worth hunting down. The only one I would hunt down is I would hunt down the 2000 edition of Acquire, because the newest edition, I think came out in 2011, is just bleh. 
No, I would even hunt down an older edition. I like the 3M edition of Acquire with the, it actually came with wooden blocks, like sort of like Scrabble before that's they did That's a really expensive version of Acquire at this point. Yeah, well, I would, that's still, it's cool because it's got the Scrabble blocks and it's awesome Acquire. But this brings it back to me. Even that one, I'm not that strong on. The fact of the matter for me is the older versions have been improved. That's the whole point of new editions. And people who say that the older editions are better are simply living in nostalgia. And so why not just buy the current version that's available? See, this is where we disagree because... Only on some games, though, because I think some... I think a lot of games you would agree the latest versions is the best. Yes, yes, I agree with that. But there's some old games. Fury of Dracula, for example, I think the original edition is the better edition because there was more free form for Dracula as opposed to the new edition where Dracula is kind of... Doesn't matter. There's a third edition pain. now, so you're going to have to wait to see if that one That's true. Even... We'll, we'll see what changes have come with the third edition. But, yeah, there's a few games where I really like the older edition. History of the World is another one where I like the original edition better than the streamlined version of the game. Um... But there's a lot of games where the new version is just as good, if not better. Um, almost always the case. They're almost always better component-wise, at least. Component-wise, they're better. Like Cosmic Encounter, the components are much better, even though I still prefer the Mayfair version because it had Lucre and all the other things. <laughs> uh, hey, I don't understand this. The, the Fancy Fight version is the, the definitive version of the game. <laughs> the Mayfair version has these little chits you move around. It had horrible stand-up But it had aliens. Luker and it had moons. The that only came moon. in the expansion anyway. The humming moon. You would have to hum when you did things. I, I thought it was cool. I, I think you're making my point for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, in general, I think new versions are better. They're usually souped up in some way. The components, obviously, from cardboard counters of old days to what you see now are much better so in general i would say you'll be perfectly happy with the new version of a game and could play it all righty well once again i'm tom vassal jason levine send us questions at dice tower at gmail.com <laughs> Coming out from the Dice Tower this week, well, uh, several reviews. We're going to be taking a look at the very popular Mysterium, the up the reprint of Mission Red Planet, the new Survive Space Attack, Wrath of Dragons, Small City, Mafia de Cuba. Z will have some reviews. Sam will have some reviews. Dan will have some reviews. We got reviews coming your way for sure. We also have another board game blender. If you've never watched Board Game Blender, it's kind of like Board Game Breakfast, except Z Garcia runs it and has a theme involved with it and that will come out this Thursday and we have a few other things that we'll be doing this week there's a possibility of a live show but that will probably be next week instead but still lots of content our, our podcast is being posted tomorrow you can check all this out at dicetower.com greetings friend Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, welcoming you to my Sea of Tranquility. What's the reason for my great sedate state, you ask? Yoga? Nope. Meditation? Not even once. Horse tranquilizers? Ran out months ago. Nope. What floats my boat of serenity is board games. Seriously, are you surprised? You see, there's many different facets about modern board games to appreciate, and each for different reasons. This variety of features is one of the things that I love about this hobby. I mean, there's of course the enjoyment of the gameplay, competition, and puzzle solving, and not to mention the social interaction, artwork, components, and even the collectability aspect. But. Among my favorite activities related to the board game hobby is punching out the cardboard components of a brand new game. Oh, that's heaven. Now, some out there may think that unpackaging the plentiful pieces from their latest playable purchase to be a pain, but I don't see it that way at all. Seriously, for me, it can be a, a tranquil, zen-like activity something almost therapeutic after a long, stressful day. Daddy! Daddy! 
Daddy, if the dog threw up. Daddy, this fell off the car. Daddy, the dog threw up again. And that's why I don't see punching components to be a chore at all. In fact, when I obtain a few new games, I'll often purposefully spread out opening them over the course of several days, savoring the experience of punching, sorting, and bagging their components. And it was while punching the pleasantly surprisingly large bounty of bits for the Exodus expansion that I started wondering whether I was in the minority or majority with my affinity for assembling amenities. Let me know what your experience has been. Punching board game components. Annoying chore or bonus relaxation exercise? Hello, my friends, the Game Boy Geek here. Last week I reviewed four games, in case you missed it. First one was New Salem. This is a game done by Overworld Games, same people that did Good Cop, Bad Cop. This has a hidden role, think resistance, with card drafting, think Sushi Go. Mix those two together, you get a lot of pointing fingers, yelling at your friends, with a historical theme of witchcraft back in Salem, Massachusetts. Really interesting game. If you like any of those two genres, check my review out on this one. Code names. This game blew my mind. This is a very special game that got a 10 from me. Games like this don't come along too often. Uh, it's like Password on steroids. Amazing party game. I, I Just go watch the review. It's unbelievable. Fun Employed is a game that takes sort of the apples to apples judging mechanism and mixes it with selling. It's very similar to a game called Snake Oil or The Big Idea or most recently But Wait There's More. But there are some differences to that and some similarities. I go over all those in my review and you're basically trying to sell yourself for any for a specific job. You're on a job interview and you're playing trait cards into your story, a little bit of storytelling, see who has the best uh, story. So check that one out. I liked it, but you just gotta make sure that the box says 13 plus and the cards have very many sexually explicit cards that you'll have to take out. The only bad side to that, but go watch that review. Dodles is a re-implementation of a Spiel des Jahres winner from 1988 from Klaus Tauber, the person that designed Settlers of Catan, where you're making clay sculptures and giving clues like Dixit where you want them to be not too easy, but not too hard. It's somewhat interesting. For me, it was just, just okay. It was just barely above average for me. Uh, but if, you, if, if that sounds interesting to you, that type of party game, Check that out. All right, let's take a look at my reviews for this past week. We'll start from the worst and go up to the best. The games that I did not like included Arcadia, which is a cool, fun, um, amusement park card collecting game similar to Splendor. Unfortunately, I didn't think it was balanced and also had some broken cards and also just had some restrictions which were very annoying. Then there was Game of Crowns, uh, which is a negotiation game, which is something I thought I would like quite a bit. And unfortunately, there was nothing really to negotiate with, so the negotiation fell completely flat for me. Firefly Shiny Dice is a dice game that was just too overwrought and too steeped in the Firefly that, and also too solitaire-ish that you took forever before your turn came back again, although Sam Healy did like this one. Rattle Battle is a game from uh, Rattle Battle uh, Hold the Loot. This is a game in which you're throwing dice into a box and then you're moving them around. It felt like a mix of miniatures with some dice rolling. It was too random for how long the game was, although it certainly is something pretty. Games that I liked, we have Heebie Jeebies. This is a party game in which 
you just basically guess what gives you the heebie-jeebies. Is it ant crawling in your ear? Um, is it someone picking their nose, a hangnail? What gives you the heebie-jeebies? Monster Laundry, a hobby game for kids where they have a, a clothesline that's wrapped around all the players and they're hanging different monsters on it as quickly as they possibly can. Bad Beats, which is kind of like a kid's version of Coup, although adults can play it, where you're trying to give beats to the dog or get rid of the, the beats so you can get ice cream uh, and you can lie about it too at the same time. Dragon Farkle, which if you don't like Farkle, you will hate. If you like Farkle, this is Farkle with special cards. I found it amusing. It's not great, but it was interesting. And there's a lot going on, but it's essentially just a push your luck game. Then we have On Her Majesty's Service. This is from Cool Mini or Not. This is a gorgeous game. I really was entranced with how nice it looked. It has rotating dials in the middle. It's basically a straightforward Euro um, economic game. And then we have Melee from Indie Boards and Cards. This is a little conquest game in which you are attacking other players. And when you attack someone, you will hide a certain amount of money in your hand. That's how much money you're paying for the battle. They have to guess. If they guess correctly, you lose. If they guess incorrectly, you win. A pretty cool mechanism. Artifacts Inc. from uh, Red Raven Games. This is a dice game. If you like Machi Koa but wish it had more teeth, this is something that you will like. I was very enamored with just how I rolled the dice and did things. Um, got to choose the different actions. And then finally, we have some games I kept. The first is Queen's Necklace. This is the reprint from Cool Mini or Not. Um, just a, a card, buying cards and playing the cards, uh, kind of in a, a blind bidding auction. Beautiful components, great game. And I replaced, well, Queen's Necklace from Days of Wonder. So that, that was an easy one for me. And then Mage Wars Academy. I added this one to my collection. Didn't get it rid of anything because I simply added it to the rest of my Mage Wars stuff in the same box. But it is a different game than Mage Wars Arena. Mage, it's essentially the same system, but there's no more moving around. They got rid of a lot of the extra stuff, and it's just a simple 30-minute take that game. I actually like it better than Mage Wars Arena. It's simple. It's fun. It's fast. It is amazing. So those are the games that I reviewed this week. See you next time. Hello, and welcome to Board Games and Bowties. My name is Mike, and on this new segment of Board Game Breakfast, we're going to talk about gateway gaming. And if you're anything like me, you introduce new people to new games all the time. And one of the most important things about introducing new people to designer games is theme. The last thing your friends want to do when they come over to dinner is pretend they're trading goods in the Mediterranean. It's a terrible idea. But as you finish up that pasta casserole and you say, hey, you ever wonder what it would like, be like to be a firefighter? Or what if we were deserted on a desert island? Or what if there was an apocalypse full of zombies or viruses? These things attract people to new games. The theme plays an important part in gateway gaming. Most of us got into this hobby because someone sometime convinced us to play a game we had never heard of that had a theme that we are at least a little bit interested in. And the way you talk about this theme is the most important thing. If you pull a couple games off your shelf and talk about how simple they are or how they aren't very strategic or how you like games in your collection way better, but the simple humans you invited over to dinner wouldn't be able to grasp the concept, or if you start throwing out gaming jargon like Ameritrash and deck building and worker placement, no one is going to want to play these games. On the other hand, if you pull a few games off your shelf with excitement in your eyes and talk about the adventure that's about to take place, if you talk about the dire state of the world and convince your dinner guests that they are the only hope for mankind, or convince them that they're awesome monsters and their only goal in life is to destroy the city and become the king of Tokyo, people get excited about that. Just remember, whatever games you use to introduce people to this hobby, do us all a favor and talk up the theme. Get people excited about the games. Well, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more conversations about gateway gaming from Board Games and Bowties. I'm Mike and we'll see you next time. gets my goat is when a game does not provide you something you need. For example, money or tokens or counters. And they usually say like, well, you got plenty of these laying around. Not necessarily. Now, Tom Vassell has plenty of these laying around, but I don't feel like having to get them. I want to get a complete game. 
Uh, James Ernest did this for a while back, and that was all his games. And I said, well, you don't buy a new VCR every time you buy uh, um, uh, and something to watch. You just buy the cassette itself. But in all honesty, this just does not work. You don't want to have to count out the components each time. Usually, you'll end up putting the components into the game permanently anyway. Hey, don't make me waste my time. Add a little bit to the price and give me all the components that I need to play the game. Hey everybody, Steve here, back with another AFR 2 Minute Drill. Now I'm recording this video on August 15th, and that's a significant date because it represents three quarters of the Major League Baseball season. The reason that's important? Well, over at Play.com headquarters, designer Keith Avalone is now at work on the 2015 in-season baseball card set for History Maker Baseball. This is the third year in a row that he'll be putting out this in-season set, and as you can imagine, it allows you to play along with the current Major League Baseball season. It's a very exciting set, and due to the way the game engine works, with just three quarters of the season completed, he's able to create a card set that very accurately captures how good or how bad players are doing this year. This set's going to be released around August 24th. The PDF of it is just $9. So if you've been waiting to jump into History Maker Baseball, this is a really fantastic time to do it and to play with the absolutely most current up-to-date baseball card set available. For those of us that have been playing since its release three years ago, this is definitely something that we look forward to every year. All right, guys, that's all for now. You can tune in to the AFR channel every Tuesday evening for all of the late-breaking news in the sports board game world. Until then, my name's Steve, and you've been watching the AFR 2-Minute Drill. On my podcast last week, I talked about... Um, Vassal's Law. Someone said, what if there was Vassal's Law, what would it be? And I said so, and then there's been a lot of debate on the internet, and so I wanted to actually look that over and rephrase it properly and bring it to you today because I absolutely believe this with all of my heart. You will probably disagree, but here we go. This is Vassal's Law. It's in two parts. Part one says, if a non-published game is truly great, a reputable, a reputable company will publish it. Okay? Part two says, if a truly great game is out of print and copies become sparse, it will eventually be reprinted. Now, first of all, before we get into these far, I am saying Vassal's Law, but of course, there's obviously going to be exceptions to everything, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But the first one, I don't believe there are exceptions to, the first part. If you are designing a game, and your game is amazing and spectacular, and thousands of people will like it, it will get printed. But if you've taken it all over and shown it to every publisher and done everything, and everyone has rejected it, then it isn't great. It might be good but it isn't great, and which is why I tell people, if no one else wants to publish your game, publishing yourself is mostly a vanity project because I'm telling you, these publishers have played so many games that most of them can see a game and go, that is a game. And I know this because when these great games come out, publishers all over are lining up saying, I want it, I want it, I want it. Last year when I was looking for games for the Dice Tower Essentials line, I was looking at the same games everybody else was. I said, I want that game. So did other people because they were truly great games. Now, we can argue over what truly great means, but in this situation, I th to me, I, I don't know how else to say it. But if your game is that fantastic, somebody will publish it. And if they don't, take a hit. Now, the second part of this is about games that are out of print. And someone says, oh, this game's out of print. What should I do? The fact is, if a game is really good and great and it's not hard to find and people really want them, they will be reprinted. Now, I'm not saying how long that reprinting time will be. You say, well, I believe you're a low open-ended. Okay, I'll say 15 years, okay? But there are people out there who look at all the games out of print. I promise you. The publishers are like, ooh, all these games are out of print. Who owns the licensing rights to these? Can this get back in? Is there a demand for it? There are lots of games that a few people love, 
but would not do well in today's market. Magic Realm is an example. There's other games that are too complex or they just haven't aged well. There's some games like Umreifenbreiten, which there are thousands of copies on the used market, so there's no point to publishing them. You know, there's just different things that, that factor in why these games don't get republished, but if a game is good, it will be republished. And I'm seeing a lot of that happening even at Essen. We're seeing a few games. We're seeing Castle come back. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, that, that balloon game from Out of the Box, which whose name is escaping me. There's different games that are coming back into print, and this will continue to happen as time goes by. Sure, they're out of print, but look, everyone was yelling about Fury of Dracula. It just came back, or it is coming back into print. Runebound, everyone, oh, where's Runebound? They're coming in with the next edition. These things will happen. Now, this one, of course, has exceptions, sometimes licensing. You know, whoever has the license for that product um, won't give it up, or there's an IP, and you're like, for example, Dune. That one can't be redone because the Frank Herbert estate won't allow it to be done, or maybe the author doesn't want someone to reprint his game, or the company is like Hasbro is sitting on the rights and won't let other companies make the game. That can stop these things. But the reason I have this law in the place is because if you are sitting there and you're saying, oh, this game is like $300, but everyone says it's the best game ever, I should buy it. Don't! Don't! Nonsense! Folks, there's like currently thousands of games in print right now. Many of those games are amazing. Amazing! Play them. And if that truly great game that your friend Peabody Schermuckle says is the best game ever and you can't live without, if it's as great as he says it is, one of two things will happen. It will come back into print eventually and you'll be able to play it. Or he will get so infuriated at you, he will buy you a copy. It's a win-win situation. So don't worry about this. Again, I know people are going to disagree with me on these, but I'm convinced of them, which is why it's called Vassal's Law. Hi, Suzanne here, and we're closing out my series about board game app pricing. Now, all this discussion started when I saw some complaints about the price of the Splendor app. And most board games like Splendor are premium priced, meaning you have to pay to play the game at all, whether or not there's IAP later. And it seems to me like a lot of the price frustration around board game apps is because consumers have grown accustomed to cheap or even free apps in other gaming genres. Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, Candy Crush, all of these slick games are free to download. So when Galaxy Tracker or Sentinels of the Multiverse comes out for 10 bucks, it feels expensive. But is it really fair to compare those? Now being a self-professed board game app expert, I suggest you try changing your comparative basis for board game apps to something more like books. A pay-as-you-go model, which is at the heart of this free-to-play system that's created this price deflation expectation, may make sense for some silly physics games or abstract puzzlers because you go as long as you want and then just stop. And in some cases, these games are little better than pushing a button and getting a pellet. For me, a board game app, even a lightweight one, offers a richer experience. You get to sink into it a little bit and challenge more than just your quick twitch reflexes. Like a book, you're going to enjoy a game end to end for the full experience. And just like you reread a favorite book, you're going to replay favorite board games knowing that you might discover something new or just enjoy the refreshed experience. And at least for me, that carries a lot of value. Now, whether or not you're on board with the book analogy, premium pricing just makes sense because of the structure of board games. The vast majority of board games don't have a logical or reasonable way to add IAP. Sure, expansions make sensible add-ons, but a lot of great board games don't have one. And considering the deeper time investment required of players to reach an expansion purchase point, an IAP-based structure would likely just be a financial loss for the vast majority of board games. And not that any of us want ads, but without the download numbers of mass market games, it's kind of a non-starter for board game apps anyhow. However you want to measure the value of a board game app, I encourage you to support board game publishers that are bringing games to the digital sphere. Because ultimately, they just extend the reach of board games to a broader audience, and they enable players to experience games they might not otherwise get to try. And I think that's worth a few bucks. See you next time. Either go well or very poorly. <laughs> I totally just recognized you by your voice. Oh, I'm famous! <laughs> <laughs>
Tom Fassel! Oh my gosh! It is such a pleasure to meet you, Tom. I'm a huge fan. Can I shake your hand? You can, oh. and I wish I could say the same. Oh. Well, you can. You know, you can just say the words. Okay, Tom. Can't there's people I'd watching? Be amused or terrified? Try Amusified. Terramused is better. You're right. Terramused. That's good too. It's a big deal for me. It's wow. He does not know how to respond. Thank you. <laughs> and child, Chaz too. Hi, right, Chaz. Come on. Hug. Give him a hug. Give him a hug. Oh, I'm gonna need so much sanitizer. <laughs> oh. I think that was an insult. <laughs> he insulted me. I'm glad to see that you're here. That means you're part of the dice tower when you get insulted. <laughs> ah, yeah! I've been insulted. <laughs> And that's it for another show, folks. Okay, my contributors are back. We're back to doing the reviews. I got a pile of reviews to do this week. I got game days scheduled this week, so we can play some more of these new games. There's a couple fantastic games that I just played yesterday, which I'll be reviewing in a few weeks. It is great, folks. Stay tuned. You'll be hearing more from Z and Sam this week, too. So there's lots of good stuff coming. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for entering the contest. I can't believe we already had 2,000 entries to the contest. That's amazing. You guys are wonderful. Until next time, I'm Tom Basil, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.